Today's episode is sponsored by Action Heat, makers of the world's best battery heated clothing. So as many of us plunge into the cold months, you can take control of your environment with heat on demand at the touch of a button. If you've ever sat in a car with heated car seats, then you've got the basic idea of how they work, and Action Heat has incorporated heat panels into about any item of clothing you could need, including jackets, socks, gloves, hats, and base layer shirts and long johns. As a special offer for our listeners, you can save 20% off your entire order by going to actionheat.com slash best to check out everything Action Heat has to offer. That's actionheat.com slash best, or use the coupon code BEST at checkout to save 20%. Stay toasty warm while you enjoy all your outdoor activities this winter with Action Heat, and we thank them for supporting the podcast. And now... Welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of the Left podcast in which we shall learn about the system of patriarchy from the perspective of how it negatively impacts men in our culture. Clips today come from YouTubers Marina Shut Up, Folding Ideas, TED Talks, PBS Game Show, and On the Media. What is the dreaded patriarchy? In the simplest terms, patriarchy is a social system that values masculinity over femininity. This type of social system dictates that men are entitled to be in charge and dominate women, and it implies that the natural state of gender relations is a dynamic of dominance and submission. According to patriarchal society, women are seen as weak, submissive, and an extension of men, and the highest accomplishment a woman can hope to attain is marriage, heterosexual, of course, and child birthing fun. On the reverse end of the spectrum, men are expected to be physically and emotionally strong, dominating, and the breadwinner and protector of his family. Although the domination of women today might not be as bad as, say, a couple hundred years ago when women had no legal rights and were considered their husband's property, or even as bad as something you'd see on an episode of Mad Men, gender is still something that is strictly enforced on people today. In patriarchal societies, cisgender men are typically valued over cisgender women. However, the system forces people into strict boxes called gender roles, and gender roles hurt everybody. If someone who is assigned a certain gender at birth doesn't fit into the social norms expected of that gender, they're often ostracized by society. In the past hundred years or so, we've seen a loosening of gender roles for women, but not so much for men. Women can act or dress in a more masculine fashion with less repercussions than if a man were to act or dress in a feminine way. This stems from the valuing of feminine traits over masculine traits and the association of femininity with weakness. It's more okay for a woman to act like a man, or whatever that means, than it is for a man to act like a woman. Alright, let's get the obvious out of the way. The first rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. Okay, okay. We're going to talk about Fight Club. Released in 1999, directed by David Fincher and adapted from the novel by Chuck Palahniuk, Fight Club is an ultra-violent reflection on masculinity, media, corporate culture, gender relationships, self-identity, fatherhood, and the conflict between individualism and collectivism. Fight Club, intentionally or not, exposes the crisis of masculine identity as the hetero white male is displaced as a societal default and the ugly hazardous reactions to that loss of unquestioned power. As we go through Fight Club, I want to hone the focus to how men interact with each other and with the concept of what it means to be a man, the societal construct, the collective idea that pops into everyone's head when we think of a real man. Also, from here on out, when I refer to Fight Club, I am more often than not referring to the organization within the movie and not the movie itself. The first thing that we need to get on the table is the notion of toxic masculinity. The common misinterpretation of this phrase is that it's being used to condemn all masculinity as though manhood itself is something inherently bad. Well, this is not true. Toxic masculinity refers to things that are typically encoded as positive or natural masculine traits that are, under a more critical look, actually damaging to self and surrounding. For example... Why? why? I don't know why. I don't know. Never been in a fight. You? No, but that, that's a good thing. No, it is not. How much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? 
Toxic masculinity is a social script that tells men and boys that the right way to be a man is to be violent, emotionally unavailable, sexually aggressive, and so forth. It's a narrow, confining definition of a man that shuts off a vast range of human experiences and marginalizes the men who fail to conform to that societal standard. It tells them what pursuits are worthy, what styles are acceptable, how a man walks, talks, and looks. Society is structured to reward men who follow the script and marginalizes those who don't. For example, aggression and hostility are held up as macho standards, natural, if not desirable, traits for men to have, despite their overwhelmingly negative impact on people, groups, and society. This has two operative effects. First, in lionizing and rewarding aggression, and second, in diminishing passivity. For an incredibly real example of the damage that lionizing aggression can cause, look no further than investment banking, an industry that attracts and rewards aggression like no other. Passive men are depicted as lesser, as weaker, as compromised, fake men, victimized by society, and the path to self-acceptance is in the primal embrace of violence. Take for example the priest who is recruited into Fight Club. Or in my own life, when discussing this episode's writing on Twitter, Adam Baldwin sent me this image of Macho Putin punching jet fighters out of the air, contrasted against what I can only assume is meant to be seen as a weak, huggy-feely Obama. Attached was the message, toxic masculinity greater than hashtag new castrati. So this is kind of why this has proven to be such a deep-seated and difficult to address issue in society. The people most invested in the macho identity are actively, knowingly promoting it and defending it from change or criticism. This narrow masculine script is often presented as naturalistic or a bio-truth, something that's an emergent property of biology and thus immune to criticism. The examples of this are long and many. Boys will be boys, men think about sex every seven seconds, men can't be friends with women because every man wants to have sex with every woman, the idea that a real man is prepared and willing to get violent at a moment's notice, and so on and so on and so on. Now, to be clear here, the problem is not in being sexual or being sexually forward. No one is saying men should all become celibate monks, only donating sperm as needed to perpetuate the species. The problem is believing that male sexuality is inherently forward and that men are, by nature, unstoppable sex fiends. Not only is this limiting of men who, say, aren't all that interested in sex or who prefer to take a more passive role in their sexual encounters, it also creates an environment of entitlement by imbuing sexual aggression with a sense of inevitability. Ideas like men can't be friends with women because he will inevitably try to have sex with her, or far worse, ideas that trot dubiously along the boundaries of consent. This then cuts both ways, demonizing men as rapists in training, such as we saw in She's Out of Control. Okay, I get it. You want it to be my fault. I'll do a little grabbing. You'll do a little protesting. Okay, 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 I got it. All right. Timothy, stop it. It's my first time. I like to be special. Now take me home. <laughs> you teasing little bitch and dismissing the role and agency of men who commit sexual violence, encapsulated in the all-too-typical post-rape response, what did you think would happen, as though being raped is an inescapable natural consequence of being off guard around men. So yes, the issue of toxic masculinity isn't merely one of pop culture interest, it's a very real subject with tangible society-altering implications. I don't need to tell you that 2018 has been a difficult year for human rights, but have you ever wondered how human rights abuses are documented around the world? With the sheer volume of global crises we're seeing, from civilian casualties in Syria, to ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, to the caging of children on U.S. borders, it's critical that we expose the truth in order to defend the rights of all and bring those responsible to justice. Human Rights Watch does just that. They are an independent, non-profit organization 
organization known for their accurate fact-finding, impartial reporting, and targeted advocacy, often in partnership with local activists and human rights groups. They accept no money from any government, but rely on the support of informed, dedicated people just like you. So if human rights are important to you, and I know they are, visit hrw.org best to make a donation and support this vital work around the world. When you do, not only is your gift tax deductible, it will be matched dollar for dollar until 2019. That means your donation will go twice as far to advance justice and defend the basic dignity of people who need it most. Again, that's hrw.org slash best. And thanks. As an actor, I get scripts. And it's my job to stay on script, to say my lines, and bring to life a character that someone else wrote. Over the course of my career, I've had the great honor playing some of the greatest male role models ever represented on television. You might recognize me as male escort number one. <laughs> uh, photographer, date rapist, to uh, shirtless date rapist from the award-winning Spring Break Shark Attack. Uh, shirtless medical student, a shirtless steroid-using con man, and in my most well-known role as Raphael. Uh, uh, a brooding, reformed playboy who falls for, of all things, a virgin, and who's only occasionally shirtless. <laughs> now, these roles don't represent the kind of man I am in my real life, but that's what I love about acting. I get to live inside characters very different than myself. But every time I got one of these roles, I was surprised. Because most of the men I play ooze machismo, charisma, and power. And when I look in the mirror, that's just not how I see myself. But it was how Hollywood saw me. And over time, I noticed a parallel between the roles I would play as a man, both on screen and off. I've been pretending to be a man that I'm not my entire life. I've been pretending to be strong when I felt weak, confident when I felt insecure, and tough when really I was hurting. I think for the most part, I've just been kind of putting on a show. But I'm tired of performing. And I can tell you right now that it is exhausting trying to be man enough for everyone all the time. Now, right? <laughs> My brother heard that. <laughs> now, for as long as I can remember, I've been told the kind of man that I should grow up to be. As a boy, all I wanted was to be accepted and liked by the other boys. But that acceptance meant I had to acquire this almost disgusted view of the feminine. And since we were told that feminine is the opposite of masculine, I either had to reject embodying any of these qualities or face rejection myself. This is the script that we've been given. Right? Girls are weak and boys are strong. This is what's being subconsciously communicated to hundreds of millions of young boys and girls all over the world, just like it was with me. Well, I came here today to say, as a man, that this is wrong, this is toxic, and it has to end. Now, um, I'm not here to give a history lesson. <laughs> We likely all know how we got here, okay? But I'm just a guy that woke up after 30 years and realized that I was living in a state of conflict. Conflict with who I feel I am in my core. And conflict with who the world tells me as a man I should be. But I don't have a desire to fit into the current broken definition of masculinity. Because I don't just want to be a good man. I want to be a good human. And I believe the only way that can happen is if men learn to not only embrace the qualities that we were told are feminine in ourselves, but to be willing to stand up, to champion, and learn from the women who embody them. Now, men, <laughs> I am not saying that everything we've learned is toxic, okay? I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with you or me. And men, I'm not saying we have to stop being men. But we need balance, right? We need balance, and the only way things will change is if we take a, a real honest look 
at the scripts that have been passed down to us from generation to generation and the roles that, as men, we choose to take on in our everyday lives. So speaking of scripts, the first script I ever got came from my dad. My dad is awesome. He's loving. He's kind. He's sensitive. He's nurturing. He's here. He's crying. (laughs) But, sorry, Dad, as a kid, I resented him for it because I blamed him for making me soft, which wasn't welcomed in the small town in Oregon that we had moved to because being soft meant that I was bullied. See, my dad wasn't traditionally masculine, so he didn't teach me how to use my hands. He didn't teach me how to hunt, how to fight. Yeah, man stuff. Instead, he taught me what he knew, that being a man was about sacrifice and doing whatever you can to take care of and provide for your family. But there was another role I learned how to play from my dad, who I discovered learned it from his dad, a state senator who later in life had to work nights as a janitor to support his family. And he never told a soul. That role was to suffer in secret. And now three generations later, I find myself playing that role too. So why couldn't my grandfather just reach out to another man and ask for help? Why does my dad to this day still think he's got to do it all on his own? I know men who would rather die than tell another man that they're hurting. But it's not because we're just all like strong, silent types. It's not. A lot of us men are really good at making friends and talking. Just not about anything real. (laughs) If it's about work or sports, or politics, or women, we have no problem sharing our opinions. But if it's about our insecurities, or our struggles, our fear of failure, then it's almost like we become paralyzed. At least, I do. So, some of the ways that I've been practicing breaking free of this behavior are by creating experiences that force me to be vulnerable. So, if there's something I'm experiencing shame around in my life, I practice diving straight into it, no matter how scary it is, and sometimes even publicly. (laughs) Because then in doing so, I take away its power. And my display of vulnerability can, in some cases, give other men permission to do the same. As an example, uh, a little while ago, I was wrestling with an issue in my life that I knew I needed to talk to my guy friends about. But I was so paralyzed by fear that they would judge me and see me as weak and I would lose my standing as a leader that I knew I had to take them out of town on a three-day guys trip (laughs) just to open up. And guess what? It wasn't until the end of the third day that I finally found the strength to talk to them about what I was going through. But when I did, something amazing happened. I realized that I wasn't alone because my guys had also been struggling. And as soon as I found the strength and the courage to share my shame, it was gone. Now, I've learned over time that if I want to practice vulnerability, then I need to build myself a system of accountability. So I've been really blessed as an actor. Um, I've built a really wonderful fan base, uh, really, really sweet and engaged And so I decided to use my social platform as kind of this Trojan horse, wherein I could create a daily practice of authenticity and vulnerability. The response has been incredible. It's been affirming. It's been heartwarming. I get tons of love and press and positive messages daily. But it's all from a certain demographic. (laughs) Women. (laughs) This is real. Why are only women following me? Where are the men? (laughs) About a year ago, I posted this photo. Now, afterwards, I was scrolling through some of the comments, and I noticed that one of my female fans had tagged her boyfriend in the picture. And her boyfriend responded by saying, please stop tagging me in gay shit. (laughs) Thanks. As if being gay makes you less of a man, right? 
So I took a deep breath, and I responded. I said, I said very politely that I was just curious because I'm on an exploration of masculinity and I wanted to know why my love for my wife qualified as gay shit. And then I said, honestly, I just wanted to learn. <laughs> now, he immediately wrote me back. I thought he was going to go off on me, but instead he apologized. He told me how growing up, public displays of affection were looked down on. He told me that he was wrestling and struggling with his ego and how much he loved his girlfriend and how thankful he was for her, for her patience. And then a few weeks later, he messaged me again. This time he sent me a photo of him on one knee proposing. And all he said was, thank you. I've been this guy. I get it. See, publicly, he was just playing his role, rejecting the feminine, right? But secretly, he was waiting for permission to express himself, to be seen, to be heard. And all he needed was another man holding him accountable and creating a safe space for him to feel. And the transformation was instant. I loved this experience because it showed me that transformation is possible, even over direct messages. So I wanted to figure out how I could reach more men, but of course, none of them were following me. <laughs> so I tried an experiment. I started posting more stereotypically masculine things. <laughs> like my challenging workouts, my meal plans, my journey to heal my body after an injury. And guess what happened? Men started to write me. And then... Out of the blue, for the first time in my entire career, a male fitness magazine called me. And they said they wanted to honor me as one of their game changers. Is that really game changing? Or is it just conforming? And see, that's the problem. It's totally cool for men to follow me when I talk about guy stuff. And I conform to gender norms. But if I talk about how much I love my wife or my daughter or my 10-day-old son, how I believe that marriage is challenging but beautiful, or how as a man I struggle with body dysmorphia, or if I promote gender equality, then only the women show up. Where are the men? So men, men, men. <laughs> men. I understand. <laughs> Growing up, we tend to challenge each other. We got to be the toughest, the strongest, the bravest men that we can be. And for many of us, myself included, our identities are wrapped up in whether or not at the end of the day we feel like we're man enough. But I got a challenge for all the guys because men love challenges. <laughs> I challenge you to see if you can use the same qualities that you feel make you a man to go deeper into yourself, your strength, your bravery, your toughness? Can we redefine what those mean and use them to explore our hearts? Are you brave enough to be vulnerable? To reach out to another man when you need help? To dive headfirst into your shame? Are you strong enough to be sensitive? to cry whether you are hurting or you're happy, even if it makes you look weak? Are you confident enough to listen to the women in your life, to hear their ideas and their solutions, to hold their anguish and actually believe them, even if what they're saying is against you? And will you be man enough to stand up to other men when you hear locker room talk? When you hear stories of sexual harassment, when you hear your boys talking about grabbing ass or getting her drunk, will you actually stand up and do something so that one day we don't have to live in a world where a woman has to risk everything and come forward to say the words, me too?
This is serious stuff. I've had to take a real honest look at the ways that I've unconsciously been hurting the women in my life. And it's ugly. My wife told me that I had been acting in a certain way that hurt her and not correcting it. Basically, sometimes when she would go to speak at home or in public, I would just cut her off mid-sentence and finish her thought for her. It's awful. The worst part was that I was completely unaware when I was doing it. It was unconscious. So here I am doing my part, trying to be a feminist, amplifying the voices of women around the world, and yet at home, I am using my louder voice to silence the woman I love the most. So I had to ask myself a tough question. Am I man enough to just shut the hell up and listen? I got to be honest, I wish that didn't get an applause. <laughs> Guys, this is real. And I'm just scratching the surface here because the deeper we go, the uglier it gets. I guarantee you, I don't have time to get into porn and violence against women or the split of domestic duties or the gender pay gap. But I believe that as men, it's time we start to see past our privilege and recognize that we are not just part of the problem, fellas. We are the problem. The glass ceiling exists because we put it there. And if we want to be a part of the solution, then words are no longer enough. There's a quote that I love that I grew up with from the Baha'i writings. It says that the world of humanity is possessed of two wings. The male and the female. So long as these two wings are not equivalent in strength. The bird will not fly. So women, on behalf of men all over the world who feel similar to me, please forgive us for all the ways that we have not relied on your strength. And now I would like to ask you to formally help us because we cannot do this alone. We are men. We're going to mess up. We're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to be tone deaf. We're more than likely probably going to offend you. But don't lose hope. We're only here because of you. And like you, as men, we need to stand up and become your allies as you fight against pretty much everything. We need your help in celebrating our vulnerability and being patient with us as we make this very, very long journey from our heads to our hearts. And um, finally, to parents. Instead of teaching our children to be brave boys or pretty girls, can we maybe just teach them how to be good humans? So back to my dad. Growing up, yeah, like every boy, I had my fair share of issues. But now I realize that it was even thanks to his sensitivity and emotional intelligence that I'm able to stand here right now talking to you in the first place. The resentment I had for my dad, I now realize had nothing to do with him. It had everything to do with me and my longing to be accepted and to play a role that was never meant for me. So while my dad may have not taught me how to use my hands, he did teach me how to use my heart. And to me, that makes him more of a man than anything. If video games treatment of women and female characters is problematic, then the ones depicting men should be okay, right? I mean, 89% of game designers and 97% of game programmers are men. Maleness is not exactly foreign territory. But if we take a closer look, things aren't always so hot for us fellas, for a couple reasons. Let's start with the physique. Obviously female bodies are ridiculous, but male ones are too. Let's do a brief survey. Kratos, check. Duke Nukem, check. Chris Redfield, Check. Coltrane, Dom, and Marcus? Check plus. Just like Barbie has physically impossible female proportions, if these guys were real people, they'd look like this. 
Now maybe you don't think it's such a big deal to show muscle-bound guys in game after game, but in aggregate, it's not without an effect. Men are starting to suffer the same body image problems that have plagued women for decades. An estimated 10 to 15% of the people who suffer from anorexia or bulimia are men. And sadly, that number of men is on the rise. There's an even more male-specific disorder called muscle dysmorphia, or bigorexia. It's overexercising and steroid abuse in an unhealthy pursuit of some imaginary, perfect, muscular body. And unfortunately, it's also on the rise. And with games, as much as their outside physique is overdeveloped, their inside emotional world is underdeveloped. Macho men in video games have a tiny emotional range and seem to be largely invulnerable to feelings like fear, trauma, or the crushing guilt of killing thousands of people. And when it comes to emotional expression, games tend to pull from the John Wayne handbook. Master Chief, Isaac Clarke, and Gordon Freeman are all short with words. Hell, Doom Guy doesn't even have a name. Now to be fair, certain games have gotten better about giving their protagonists reasons for their actions, which makes them feel less like atrocity committing robots. Joel, from The Last of Us, has one of the most poignantly fleshed out backgrounds in all of gaming, but that hardly justifies what a murderous psychopath he becomes as the game progresses. And like Joel, men are expected to lead, even when they've suffered. Booker DeWitt may be scarred from the Civil War, but a little PTSD doesn't stop him from saving Elizabeth. Even two of my favorite games, Ico and Enslaved, find their tortured protagonists in positions of strength, not weakness. Men are always expected to be the hero, no matter what. But there's something much deeper that's actually more problematic. In fact, it's so glaringly obvious that you probably don't even notice it. Let's stop talking about the main character for a moment and take a look around at our virtual world. In games that feature people, who gets killed? It's men, it's almost always men. And who gets placed in the line of fire? Men also. If we flipped the genders and had a game where you killed woman after woman after woman with nary a man in sight, people would probably get a little upset. And with good reason. But maybe you're saying, what's so bad about killing other men? Who cares if we're acclimated to seeing thousands of men die over and over again in games? Who cares if the vast majority of men are expected to be disposable? Well, maybe now's a good time to stop and think about what that disposability actually means. In The Myth of Male Power, former National Organization of Women board member Warren Farrell says that men have been systematically trained to sacrifice their health, their bodies, and ultimately their lives without question for the good and protection of women and children. And historically speaking, there's good reason for this. If you had a tribe of 200 people split 50-50 between men and women, and you lost 75% of the men to fighting with neighboring tribes, then you could still repopulate your society. But if you lost 75% of the women, then you're going to have a really tough time getting your society back on track. So from a purely biological perspective, it's easy to understand why women are more important to protect than men who, well, as a group are just expendable. And this idea of the expendable male has been going on for so long that we don't even bat an eye when we spend hours mowing down dudes in games. Now I don't believe Pharrell's conclusion that patriarchal societies benefit women at the expense of men. But that observation about male disposability certainly rings true for the current state of games. I want to be clear, this isn't a pissing contest about who has it worse, men or women. And it's certainly not a sermon against violent games. You can see my thoughts about violent video games here. But think about it this way. As with women, we should think about the impact that men in games has on men in the real world. It could be unreasonable body expectations, or an inability to express emotion, or the pressure to man up and be a leader. We're gonna whoop your mama's ass! The reality is that in real life, gender roles are changing. We don't live in that same small tribe of 200 people anymore. Where once men were only required to be stoic soldiers and solo providers, now they're also expected to be involved fathers and supportive partners. And this is on top of the amazing strides that women have made in the home and in the workplace over the last half century. This is all wonderful progress, and games should reflect that broader shift. And there are, of course, signs of hope. Unlike his strong, fearless brother, Luigi successfully trembles his way through Luigi's mansion, Dark Moon. And in Heavy Rain, architect Ethan Mars experiences profound emotional conflict about the violent things he has to do to save his son. Video games are a way to explore other identities in a fun, safe way. Shouldn't games point to the way things should be, rather than just the ways they've always been?
Today's episode is sponsored by Madison Reed. Amy Errett founded the company in 2013, naming it after her daughter, with a mission to revolutionize the way women color their hair. As is so often the case, the status quo options either left much to be desired or cost way too much. Madison Reed offers the quality of a salon, the convenience and affordability of at-home hair color, and an ammonia-free formula with ingredients you can feel good about. You'll look like you just came from the salon, but without the huge time commitment. Experience beautiful, multi-dimensional hair color made in Italy, delivered to your door, on your schedule, for under $25. Hundreds of thousands of women have already tried and loved Madison Reed, so go ahead and give it a try for yourself. You can start by finding your perfect shade at madison-reed.com, and they have a special offer for you as a Best of the Left listener. Right now, you can get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit when you use the promo code LEFT. That's madison-reed.com, and use the promo code LEFT. Masculinity studies, which is what I would call it, I guess, is a subfield of gender studies. Michael Kimmel is a professor of sociology and gender studies at Stony Brook University. Gender studies, of course, is the sort of expansion of women's studies from the 70s and 80s. Women's studies made women visible. It went back into history and literature and said, you know, we've really got to rediscover some of the great women artists and writers and poets and historical figures. But it also made gender visible. We became aware that gender is one of the organizing principles of social life, that gender is one of the foundations of your identity. Women and men and others who began to sort of say, well, what about men's lives? Let's talk about how men's lives are gendered. A similar process was going on around what we came to call critical whiteness studies. People said, well, what does it mean to be white? Yeah, by particularizing whiteness rather than seeing it as a default, or men rather than seeing it as a default, you otherize it in a good way, like everything else is otherized. You see it against a backdrop that isn't just itself. Exactly right. Making the center visible as just one other identity. So, for example, if you were to take a course on 19th century British literature, When you talked about the Brontes or when you talked about Jane Austen, you would, of course, talk about gender. But when you talked about Dickens, Dickens is a social problem novelist. So, of course, he only talked about class, despite the fact that if you look at his longest books, they were all books about young boys looking for authentic Mm. fathers like Oliver Twist or David Copperfield. Those are also meditations about masculinity. Between the alt-right men at Charlottesville and the perpetrators of school shootings and other mass violence and Kanye West bemoaning what he (laughs) sees as constraints on his freedom of thought. Something is coalescing that feels new, but is it? I published a book in 2013 called Angry White Men. I've been studying the extreme right and other groups of men who feel aggrieved. And the phrase that I came up with is aggrieved entitlement. My first encounter with these guys came about 15 years ago on a TV talk show for white men who believed that they were the victims of reverse discrimination in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And the title of that show was a quote from one of the men, a black woman stole my job. And so when it was my turn to speak, I just said, I have one question for you guys about the title of this show, a black woman stole my job. Where did you get the idea? It was your job. Why isn't it like a black woman got the job? Now, what's interesting to me about this particular historical moment is there's a large swath of white men who believe that they are the victims of reverse discrimination. There is also a country that has come to believe that they have been victimized. I grew up, Brooke, believing that the United States was basically the biggest, baddest bully on the block. Now, You hear Donald Trump saying, no, no, we're the victims. China's taking advantage of us. NATO, the UN, the EU, we're the victims. We have to regain our swagger. And of course, Trump, every single day, tweets how he is the victim of a witch hunt. And so all three of these, Trump the man, the U.S. as a country, and the this aggrieved entitlement among angry white men are all coalescing in this particular moment. So you're distinguishing between aggrieved entitlement and garden variety, misogyny, and domestic violence, which we've had with us forever. 
I think that they're connected. Many of the men who batter their wives or partners don't usually talk about it as the initiation of aggression. They talk about it as revenge, as retaliation. She made me do it. You didn't have dinner ready. What did you expect? So in that sense, it has a similar kind of rhetoric. But the traditional way that we've understood it is that these are individual isolated cases. And now what we see with the development of the manosphere and all these Reddit fora, et cetera, is the development of communities of men who are supporting each other, encouraging each other, egging each other on in their sense of righteous victimization. So do you think that element of aggrieved political entitlement led by Donald Trump, does that aggrieved entitlement fuel the personal kind? What I'm saying is that there are connections between them. This is speculation. I don't think there's ever been a study of uh, the Reddit communities But most of the men's rights guys, most of the red pill guys, the men going their own way, my suspicion is they would be centrist Democrats. Why? Why would you think that? I've interviewed quite a number of them, the men's rights guys. You know, they feel uncomfortable with Trump's policies because they see Trump's policies favoring the super rich over the ordinary American, although they do like the sense of entitlement to women's bodies. So how do they square that circle? My sense is that they don't. They run on parallel tracks. The van driver in Toronto cited Elliot Roger, who was famously in one of these extreme groups. Roger killed people after leaving a video suicide note about how he was destined to die a virgin. And he Mm -hmm. references a guy named George Sedini, who walked into Mm -hmm. an aerobic studio in Pennsylvania and killed women, and that was 2009? 2009, yeah. Yeah. So, So, yes, every few years, there has been a guy who believes himself to be a good-looking, clean-cut, white guy, entitled to sex. George Sedini says, I haven't had sex in 10 years. You owe me. I'm angry. Now, Elliot Roger, he didn't reference Sodini, but he did the same thing in Santa Barbara. He said, you know, I'm much nicer and better looking than all those guys that you're sleeping with. I'm going to get my revenge. Al Sarian in Toronto referenced Elliot Roger. So I think we have these sporadic events that otherwise wouldn't have been connected Mm -hmm. to some kind of larger movement. But with the advent of all of these Reddit fora and and the internet, they now feel like they have a community. I think when these guys actually act out like this, the members of those communities probably face some kind of anguish, like, well, I understand why he did it, but I wouldn't do that. But what binds them together, what unites them, it seems to me, is this sense that as men in this culture, they deserve sex. And part of that is that we have constructed sexuality, the sexual relations between women and men, as a kind of adversarial sport. If I get some and you give it up, I win and you lose. It's a zero-sum game. So if I don't get it, I feel like a loser. 20 years ago, if you were what we would now call an incel, that is involuntarily celibate, you'd be self-medicating with drugs or alcohol. You'd be sitting around just sort of moping, or you'd be trying to get out there and keep going to singles bars and keep trying. But you would feel alone. Now, when I put out into cyberspace my anguish, someone writes back and says, oh, I feel your pain, man. I get it. And suddenly you have a brother. How do you feel that the extreme incidents have been covered? On the one hand, you have to report the motives of these particular actors when they do these horrific things. If it's a white person, we think, well, they were mentally ill. If it was, you know, a a person of color, we think it's something in their culture or their religion, Mm -hmm. because that's how racism works. Mm -hmm. You know, racism disaggregates white people, but aggregates people of color. You have an obligation to cover their motives. On the other hand, you also know that there will be people who go, wow, that's how I've been feeling. I didn't know there was a word for it. Uh, You also think, though, that the focus on these big incidents might lead we in the media to miss the legitimate anguish at the core of some right-wing thought. For example, we have a clip here from Tucker Carlson from Fox. He had this recurring segment a couple of months ago called What is Happening to Men? Women on average are scoring higher on IQ tests than men are. 
Even physically, men are falling behind. A recent study found that almost half of young men failed the Army's entry-level physical fitness exam during basic training. Fully Even as women far outpace men in higher education, for example, virtually every college campus supports a women's studies department whose core goal is to attack male power. Men seem to be becoming less male. Sperm counts, for example, across the West have plummeted. They're down almost 60% since the early 1970s. Scientists don't know why this is. Nothing like this has ever happened to a population this big. American men are failing in body, in mind, and in spirit. This is a crisis. It is true that girls and women are outpacing boys and men in college and in high school and middle school. 75% of high school valedictorians last year were girls. But even though 60% of all college students are female, more people are going to college than ever before. The rate of increase among girls is greater and faster than the rate of increase among boys. Mm -hmm. But there are more boys in school today than there were 30 years ago. So it's not like boys are vanishing. But here's the other side of that. He does point out there are many men who are in pain. When I interviewed the white nationalist, I heard that same refrain over and over again. They were badly done by, they were hurt, they were angry. I think that they were right. But what I wanted to say to them, is, do you really think that it was immigrants who gave them those predatory loans? Was it LGBT people who caused climate change? Was it feminist women who outsourced their jobs? My feeling is they're right to be angry, but they're delivering their mail to the wrong address. What about these women's studies departments whose core goal is to attack male power? It's a certain kind of male narcissism to think that women's studies courses are preoccupied with men. In fact, what they're preoccupied with is women. It is true that women have identified that in our society, what gender inequality means is the power of men over women and also the power of some men over other men. You can't just talk about men and women, but which men exactly? You know, the power of some men, white men, over men of color, class, ethnicity, uh, religion, age, all of these are the ways in which some men dominate other men. So yes, of course, they're interested in power, but they're, they, they really have better things to do than just talk about their gripes about men. <laughs> Point taken. I just wonder, do you think, as a gender studies professor with a specialty in uh, masculinities, you might offer a solution on college campuses as a complement to women-centered gender studies classes? The real solution would be not to have separate masculinity studies programs, but rather to integrate into our literature courses, our history courses, the fact that not only were women working out issues around gender, but so were men. After the Republican primaries, where we were constantly talking about the size of people's hands, mm -hmm. it became very clear that this was a whole exercise about who's the real man. So I grew up in uh, New York City, between Harlem and the Bronx. Growing up as a boy, we was taught that men had to be tough, had to be strong, had to be courageous, dominating, no pain, no emotions, with the exception of anger and definitely no fear. That men are in charge, which means women are not. That men lead, and you should just follow and just do what we say. That men are superior, women are inferior, that men are strong, women are weak, that women are of less value, property of men and objects, particularly sexual objects. I've later come to know that to be the collective socialization of men, better known as the man box. See, this man box has in it all the ingredients of how we define what it means to be a man. Now, I also want to say, without a doubt, there are some wonderful, wonderful, absolutely wonderful things about being a man. Well, at the same time, there's some stuff that's just straight up twisted. And we really need to begin to challenge, look at it, 
and, and really get in the process of deconstructing, redefining what we come to know as manhood. This is my two at home, Kendall and Jade. They're 11 and 12. Kendall's 15 months over than Jade. There's a period of time, you know, when my wife, her name is Tammy and I, we just got real busy and whip it, bit, bam, boom, Kendall and Jade. Right. And when they were about five and six, four and five, you know, Jade could come to me. It didn't matter. Come to me crying, you know. It didn't matter what she was crying about. She can get on my knee. She can snot my sleeve up. Just cry, cry it out. Daddy got you. That's all that's important. Now, Kendall, on the other hand, and like I said, he's only 15 months older than her. He come to me crying. It's like soon as I would hear him crying, a clock would go off. You know, I would give the boy probably about 30 seconds, which means by the time he got to me, I was already saying things like, why are you crying? Hold your head up. Look at me. Explain to me what's wrong. Tell me what's wrong. I can't understand you why you're crying. And out of my own frustration, of my role and responsibility of building him up as a man to, to fit into these guidelines and these structures that are defining this man box, I would find myself saying things like, just go in your room. Just go on, go on in your room. Sit down. Get yourself together. And come back and talk to me when you could talk to me like a what? Like a man. And he's five years old. You know, as I grow in life, I would say to myself, my God, what's wrong with me? What what am I doing? You know, why why would I do this? And I think back, I think back to my father. There was a time in my life where we had a very troubled experience in our family. My brother Henry, he died tragically when we was teenagers. We lived in New York City, as I said, we lived in the Bronx at the time. And the burial was place called Long Island. About, it was about two hours outside of the city. And as we were preparing to come back from the burial, you know, the, the cars stopped at the bathroom, you know, to let folks take care of themselves for the long ride back to the city. And the limousine empties out. My mother, my sister, my auntie, they all get out, but my father and I stayed in the limousine. And no sooner than the women got out, he burst out crying. He didn't want to cry in front of me but he knew he wasn't gonna make it back to the city. It was better me than to allow himself to express these feelings and emotions in front of the women. And, and this is a man who 10 minutes ago had just put his teenage son in the ground. I, something I just, can't even, I just can't even imagine. The thing that sticks with me the most is that he was apologizing to me for crying in front of me. And at the same time, he was also giving me props, lifting me up for not crying. You know, I come to also look at this as this, this fear that we have as men, this fear that just have us paralyzed, holding us hostage to this man box. I can remember speaking to a 12-year-old boy, a football player, and I asked him, I said, how would you feel if in front of all the players, your coach told you you were playing like a girl? Now, I expected him to say something like, I'll be sad, I'll be mad, I'll be angry or something like that. No, the boy said to me, the boy said to me, it would destroy me. And I said to myself, God, if it would destroy him to be called a girl, what are we then teaching him about girls? It took me back to a time when I was about 12 years old. I grew up in tenement buildings, you know, in the inner city. And at this time, we're living in the Bronx. And in the building next to where I lived, there was a guy named Johnny. He's about 16 years old, and we were all about 12 years old, younger guys. And he was hanging out with all us younger guys. And this guy, he was up to a lot of no good. He was the kind of kid where parents would have to wonder, what is this 16-year-old boy doing with these 12-year-old boys? And he did spend a lot of time up to no good. He was a troubled kid. You know, his mother had died from a heroin overdose. He was being raised by his uh, grandmother. His father wasn't on the set. His grandmother had two jobs. He was home alone a lot. But I got to tell you, we young guys, we looked up to this dude, man. He was cool. He was fine. That's what his sister said. He was fine, right? He was having sex. 
You know, we all looked up to him. So one day I'm out in front of the house doing something, just playing around, doing something. I don't know what. He looks out his window. He calls me upstairs. He said, hey, Amp. they called me Anthony growing up as a kid. Hey, Anthony, come on upstairs. Johnny call, you go. So I run right upstairs. As he opens the door, he says to me, do you want some? Now, I immediately knew what he meant. Because for me growing up at that time and our relationship with this man box, do you want some meant one of two things, sex or drugs. And we weren't doing drugs. Now, my box, my card, my man box card was immediately in jeopardy. Two things. One, I never had sex. We don't talk about that as men. You only tell your dearest, closest friends who want to seek for life the first time you had sex. For everybody else, we go around like we've been having sex since we was two. There ain't no first time. <laughs> The other thing I couldn't tell him is that I didn't want any. You know, that's even worse. We're supposed to always be on the prowl. Women are objects, especially sexual objects. So anyway, I couldn't tell him any of that. So like my mother would say, make a long story short, I just simply said to Johnny, yes. He told me, go in his room. I go in his room, on his bed is a girl from the neighborhood named Sheila. She's 16 years old. She's nude. She is what I know today to be mentally ill, higher functioning at times than others. We had a whole choice worth, you know, inappropriate name for her. But anyway, Johnny had just gotten through having sex with her. Well, he actually raped her, but he would say he had sex with her because while Sheila never said no, she also never said yes. So he was offering me the opportunity to do the same. So when I go in the room, I close the door. Folks, I'm petrified. I stand with my back to the door so Johnny can't bust in the room and see that I'm not doing anything. And I stand there long enough that I could have actually done something. So now I'm no longer trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of this room. So in my 12 years of wisdom, I zip my pants down. I walk out into the living room. And lo and behold to me, while I was in the room with Sheila, Johnny was back at the window calling guys up. So now it's a living room full of guys. Like, you know, like the waiting room in the doctor's office. And they asked me, how was it? And I say to them, it was good. And I zip my pants up in front of them and I head for the door. Now I say this all with remorse and I was feeling a tremendous amount of remorse at that time but I was conflicting because while I was feeling remorse I was excited because I didn't get caught but I knew I felt bad about what was happening. This fear getting outside the man box totally enveloped me, enveloped me. It was way more important to me about me and my man box card than about Sheila and what was happening to her. See, collectively, we as men are taught to have less value in women, to view them as property and the objects of men. We see that as an equation that equals violence against women. We as men, good men, the large majority of men, we operate on the foundation of this, this whole collective socialization. We kind of see ourselves separate, but we're very much a part of it. You see, we have to come to understand that less value, property, and objectification is the foundation, and the violence can't happen without it. So we're very much a part of the solution as well as the problem. The Centers for Disease Control says that men's violence against women is at epidemic proportions, is the number one health concern for women in this country and abroad. So quickly, I'd like to just say, you know, this is my love of my life, my daughter Jay, the world I envision for her. How do I want men to be acting and behaving? I need you on board. I need you with me. I need you working with me and me working with you on how we raise our sons and teach them to be men. That it's okay to not be dominating. That it's okay to have feelings and emotions. That it's okay to promote equality. That it's okay to have women who are just friends and that's it. That it's okay to be whole. That my liberation as a man is tied to your liberation as a woman. I remember asking a, a nine-year-old boy, I asked a nine-year-old boy, what would life be like for you if you didn't have to adhere to this man box? He said to me, I would be free.
We've just heard clips today starting with YouTuber Marina Shut Up explaining what patriarchy is, Folding Ideas looked at the effects of toxic masculinity on men through the lens of the film Fight Club, our first TED Talk was from Justin Baldoni on the need for men to push back on the ideas of being man enough, PBS Game Show looked at the video game stereotypes that hurt men and boys, on the media explored masculinity studies and aggrieved entitlement, and finally we just heard our second TED Talk from Tony Porter putting out a call to men to help free ourselves from the prison of patriarchy. Members will be getting a bonus episode with a couple of additional clips on the resulting effects of patriarchy on men who see their lives taking a turn for the worse. Uh, we're going to explore a couple of important issues, one being that the trajectory of one's life can have a much greater impact on one's self-image than objective reality, meaning that if you're down but things are looking up, you'll probably feel better than if you're up but things are looking down. And we'll also revisit a recent conversation we've been having with members about how understanding the systemic forces that contribute to one's suffering can help alleviate that suffering. To hear all of that, to cast a weekly vote on what upcoming topics you want to hear on the show, and for other details about supporting the show by being a patron, visit patreon.com slash bestoftheleft. You can find that link in the show notes on the device you're using to listen, which is also where you can find links to each of today's segments for easy reference and sharing. And now, we'll hear from you. Hi, Jay. This is... Erica, I'm 20 years old from Illinois, and I just listened to your episode about right-wing terrorism and my thoughts when it comes to privacy and whether or not we should release our voter information is that I feel like those two topics are heavily linked in the way that I feel that if we do allow this voter information to go public, then it could be susceptible to violence. But I'm happy to hear your thoughts. And also on the Finland topic on tax returns, I feel like that that's a fantastic idea since tax returns are a less controversial subject in our less likely to result in violence, I feel like that that would be okay, and not only just okay, but also beneficial to make public. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Voter information, I feel like, could be, that could lead to violence if someone votes the quote-unquote wrong way, but I feel like that tax return I feel like it wouldn't be as dangerous or harmful. But anyway, thanks for taking my voicemail, and I enjoy listening to your show. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. Just a quick note to Erica, who we just heard from, some clarifications on what is and isn't private. So voter registration records and records of whether or not you voted are already public. That is the status quo. There are no records, however, on who you voted for. So you still have the secret ballot, but uh, whether or not you're registered, what party you're registered with, if any, and whether or not you voted, just a yes or no, they did vote, they didn't vote, all those things are public. And uh, so I just want to clarify that. And again, I still plan to get back to this privacy discussion. I, I want to get into some more details, uh, but I have another topic that is more pressing uh, related to today's episode that I need to deal with. I just need to explain where feminism went wrong. No big deal. Yes, I'm, I'm 35, I'm a straight white male, and I'm going to explain where feminism went wrong, so buckle up. Of, of course, I don't mean all feminism or all feminists, hashtag not all feminists, uh, but today's show was meant to highlight 
many, but not nearly all of the ways in which men are actually harmed by the system that we know of as the patriarchy. And if you were to talk with men's rights activists, who, in my perspective, are profoundly confused about the state and nature of the world, they would read you a long list of things that exist in our society that disadvantage men. Some of the highlights would include uh, military service draft, historical war deaths are dominated by men, uh, workplace deaths are dominated by men due to the fact that men traditionally have more dangerous jobs slash jobs at all. Things like you know the chivalrous notion of women and children being rescued first and, and men being left behind. All, all these fall sort of under the category of the expendability of men is, is what they would say. And then there are other categories like sexual and physical abuse. And you know, as we know, women are abused sexually and physically far more often for a whole variety of reasons, namely physical and the social power imbalance. But men are also abused. And what's uh, extra terrible in, in that scenario is although women are often blamed for their own abuse, which is bad, men are, are often not believed at all because of this sense like, well, men are big and strong and can't be abused or, you know, men always want to have sex so they can't be raped, that, that sort of thing. And all of these things stem from patriarchy. They, they stem from notions of masculinity that, uh, you know, men are the only ones capable of going to war. Men are the only ones capable of doing dangerous jobs. The, the idea about uh, needing to protect women is it's uh, multifaceted. It goes back to, you know, in part that they're weak and fragile and need to be protected. And then also like the really deep rooted idea that, uh, you know, if your uh, tribe is nearly wiped out, you're going to be a lot better off if you have one man and 20 women than one woman and 20 men to try to rebuild the population. So for that kind of a concept, the need to protect women is, is sort of obvious in an evolutionary way. So that's just a partial list. And there are a lot of things in society that do honestly disproportionately affect men in negative ways. But none of this means as men's rights activists would have you believe, that feminism has gone too far and is now actually oppressing men. These things are the entry fee men pay to join the club of men that runs the world. And I'm going to attempt to explain the nature of how this works in conjunction with the uh, one of the major missteps, I think, the, uh, the the feminist movement has made. So where I, I think the movement to liberate women from patriarchy went wrong was in not recognizing that they weren't the only ones who needed to be liberated. And what's important to understand is that this is how it has to work. A system of oppression in, in our modern society cannot only oppress strictly one portion of the population. It has to give this sort of veneer of fairness. And I, I learned this concept in The New Jim Crows, one of the most profound points being made uh, by Michelle Alexander when talking about the racist nature of the penal system in America. So like 150 years ago, slaves could be thought of as completely less than human because culture allowed that back then. But in modern society, we've sort of progressed to a certain extent and have all basically agreed that everyone is fully human and deserves basically the same opportunities. And so a system of oppression, in order to continue to exist in this modern society, has to pretend that that's the case. So, for instance, laws are written that specifically target black and brown people, though they technically apply to everyone. So a disingenuous lawmaker can claim, hey, the laws are morally neutral because they apply to everyone. How could this law be called racist? Because it applies to white people, too. And so then when black and brown people end up disproportionately affected by the law, those lawmakers can claim, hey, it's just because there's a problem with those individuals rather than a problem with the law. 
And the same goes for voter disenfranchisement is another good example. So they write laws that they know will target Democratic voters, otherwise known as young people, people of color, etc. Um, but the law technically affects everyone equally. You know, if, if those college students had gun licenses, well, then they'd qualify just as much as anyone else with a gun license. So it's even, right? So this is how systems of oppression maintain themselves in a modern society that values fairness, at least ostensibly. The system has to at least pretend to be fair. And to pretend to be fair, you have to hurt some of the people who are ostensibly on the side of relative privilege. And I, I get it. This is a hard concept to wrap one's mind around, but stick with me. Uh, I, I think we'll get there. So, for instance, with the justice system, plenty of white people are sent to jail based on laws that were written to target people of color. Plenty of Republicans are disenfranchised from voting by voter ID laws that are written to target Democrats. And men experience plenty of negative impact from patriarchy that is designed to benefit men. And so to be clear, it still makes sense to put most of our focus where the harm is greatest, but there's no reason to lose sight of the other areas where harm is being inflicted. Just because it makes sense to focus on our criminal justice system as a racist system by pointing to all of the young black men it incarcerates for nonviolent drug crimes that were written to target them doesn't mean we shouldn't also care about all of the white people in prison for those same crimes. Just because we focus on voter ID laws as racist and discriminatory against people of color and the greater Democratic Party coalition doesn't mean we shouldn't be outraged about the Republican who is turned away from voting for the same reason. And just because we are right to focus on all of the ways women and girls are targeted by the system of patriarchy doesn't mean we should lose sight of the ways men and boys are being harmed too. So as we heard in the first clip today, patriarchy isn't about men and women only. It's about elevating the masculine over the feminine, broadly speaking, and then enforcing gender roles to keep women in the feminine box and men in the masculine box. So while one box is elevated over the other, both genders suffer from being locked in a box at all. But to sustain a system like this in an era when we supposedly value fairness, at least more now than we used to, the system has to continually reinvent itself to display this veneer of fairness, make it seem like it's fair. So, you know, we can say, well, women get paid less, but men have all the dangerous jobs. And that's part of it. That's part of the trade-off. Or, you know, sure, men get to run the government almost entirely by themselves, but they also have to die in all the wars. So it gives people uh, the, these men's rights activists or just old white men or Republicans or whoever, it, it gives them the argument to say, hey, it's, it's not that it's unfair. It's just that we all have our own roles to play. And then they get to ignore that the roles are systemically unfair. So they can give arguments like that or, or give examples like that. And, and they might not necessarily be untrue, but they are woefully incomplete and they are in essence, designed by the system, N not in like a mastermind controlling the system sort of way, but in, in the same way that evolution designs living creatures to best fit their surroundings, systems evolve to perpetuate and, and sustain their power. And the way that an oppressive system can sustain itself during a time when we value fairness is that it cannot be 100% unequal, because if it were, it wouldn't be tolerated by anyone. So, you know, j just like if uh, our prison system had zero white people in it, well, the racism would be too obvious to be sustained. So the system has to let in some white people. And just like if no black people were able to register to vote, again, the racism would be too obvious. If we lived in a world of pure patriarchy, where men had literally every benefit and women had none, it would be too unequal to be defended by anyone. Imagine a world where men held 
all the positions of power, but that's pretty much all they had to do. You know, women had to do all of the dangerous jobs. They had to fight all of the wars, and chivalry dictated that they had to stand aside while men and children were rescued because men needed to be protected, and women still had to do all the housework. But during child custody cases, men were always granted custody because it was just understood that men were better suited to raise children. And, and you know, again, chivalry required women to open all the doors for men and pay for all the meals. And, and sexual abuse was still rampant, but it was assumed that women couldn't be raped because they're all so horny all the time that they're willing to have sex with anyone who will have them. That's a system that couldn't be sustained in today's culture, and maybe not any culture that's existed for hundreds of years or, or ever. Therefore, through a process of constant evolution, our system of patriarchy doesn't look like that. It gives enough of a veneer of equality that people can find ways to defend it, even though it is, in fact, completely unfair and indefensible. But in order to ultimately defeat that system and bring about the genuine equality feminists are looking for, we need everyone on board, as many as we can get, and that includes a big chunk of men who can be taught to recognize all of the ways that they personally are being hurt by the system that they may actually be actively defending right now. There are a lot of feminist men out there in favor of changing the system based purely on fairness and altruism. Uh, but this should really be like the 99% versus the 1% all over again, because the number of men who really benefit from patriarchy without all of the negative side effects is minuscule. Men in the men's rights movement who are upset about men being expendable in wars and dangerous jobs need to see that as a result of a patriarchy that sees women as too weak or fragile to do the work, or is not intellectually capable of going into fields like engineering. Men who are upset that sexual and physical abuse against men isn't taken seriously need to understand that this is the result of the hyper-masculinity and hypersexuality expectations placed on men. Men are supposed to be strong, therefore they can't be abused. Men always want to have sex, therefore they can't be raped. That's not feminism imposing those rules. That's patriarchy. Men who point to the high suicide rate of men need to recognize that the total lack of emotional range that men have to deal with their problems is a result of the patriarchy that reinforces only masculine emotions for men and boys, almost exclusively anger, while suppressing all other emotions because they're seen as feminine and therefore not desirable. Men with a greater range of healthy emotions would be far less likely to commit suicide, and it's not the feminists who are reinforcing those gender roles. So for the feminists out there, which is going to be most of you, uh, what I have to say is, is don't make the mistake of denying that men also have problems and are also victims of the patriarchy just because women have suffered more. If you've been conflating feminism with women or smashing the patriarchy with women's liberation— you may need to realign yourself, stay with the smashed patriarchy theme, but widen your perspective so that you can be the defender of everyone who is adversely affected by the patriarchy, regardless of their gender. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on this or anything else. Keep the comments coming in at 202-999-3991. That is going to be it for today. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash bestofleft, as that is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast, coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestoftheleft.com. Mm -hmm.